Thank you very much. Welcome to the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series, brought to you by the Kennedy Center and Prince William Network. I'm Billy Taylor, and with me is Estella Olevsky. I'm from South America. And I'm from North America. We love the same kinds of music, even though we play different kinds of music. I play classical music. And I play jazz. I play many songs that come from the same roots as some of her South American music. And though the music is quite different from mine, she plays it with the same spirit. Estella's going to play some classical pieces, and I'm going to play some jazz. And through our music, we hope to show you some of the differences and some of the similarities of the two styles. Now, we're going to play some more music together in a little while. But first, Estella's going to give you, well, she's going to tell you a little about European classical music and the traditional way in which it's played. The first piece I'm going to play for you is by Frédéric Chopin, one of the great composer pianists who lived in Poland. He is uh, perhaps the most famous of all classical composers for piano. He composed a lot of pieces called etudes. These are technical pieces. And he composed one for almost every possible technical problem. And it is said that if you can play all 24 of Chopin preludes, you can really play anything. Um, the challenge in the particular etude I'm going to play is to bring out this beautiful melody uh, with the pinky of the right hand and the bass line is played by the pinky of the left hand. So right hand plays the melody, left hand plays the bass line, and in between I accompany myself with the other fingers and I play the harmony part of it. As I'm playing, see if you can follow the melody. Thank you very much. Now, I just want to show you something. If I were to play this like an exercise, as an etude, a boring etude, it would sound something like this.
That would be boring. And it's because I would not be bringing out the melody with a pinky and obviously playing that louder than the rest of the notes. Um, there is also another way that I could play it, and I, I do this to practice it. I play it with chords, just with harmony, and it would sound something like this. That's quite pretty, but it's very different than the real piece. So now let's listen to what Dr. Taylor is going to tell you about a jazz etude. How is it different than a classical etude? Well, you heard thirds she was playing. Though that chord is made up of thirds. And uh, I wanted to, in playing jazz, playing jazz melodies, I wanted to use not only that, but fourths, which is a sounds a little different. So if I were to play the thirds, it would sound like that. If I were to play the, the, the fourths, it sounds a little different. So I wanted to use that. I wanted to use it to make up a melody. Many jazz uh, melodies are made up as we go along. All of the notes that uh, were played uh, in the Chopin piece a moment ago uh, were written by Chopin, and uh, he wanted it played exactly that way. When I play, uh, I make up other things. I mean, I, I play a little bit of what I wrote, and then I try to say, well, maybe I could develop it in a different way. And I try to do it uh, like this. One of the things I try to do is to make the melody happen so you can hear the melody. And uh, uh, the idea of having the force in one element, uh, but using that with other things to make the melody a little more attractive. Uh, I make it up as I go along. No script, same kind of thing whenever uh, I play. This is an etude that helps me do this.
Now in that first piece called the harp etude, I talked about melody and harmony. You notice how it was kind of whispery, imitating a sound of uh, wind going through the strings. Now this next piece is about rhythm and um, it's in a typical waltz rhythm, which is something like this. I'm sure you've heard that before. <laughs> And um, the waltz is one of the favorite forms of composers. Every composer dreams to write a beautiful waltz. Chopin wrote many beautiful waltzes. Now, not all the waltzes are for dancing. Some are for dancing, some are for listening, and some are even sung. The one I'm going to play is a listening kind of waltz. And listen to the left hand that keeps the tempo steady. Waltzes are uh, played in jazz also, and I like to do it. But I also like to do uh, something where the uh, melodies are kind of uh, uh, mixed up with the harmony, and you hear all at once. Chopin used thirds, as you could hear, uh, and as we talked about. The thirds in, in this particular piece, which is called Rejoice, They are part of the harmony, and so uh, instead of playing the uh, kind of rhythm that would make you want to dance, I'm trying to play the rhythm so that you'll want to listen. And uh, this is uh, uh, a piece called Rejoice, and it's supposed to make you kind of, hopefully, make you feel kind of happy.
I hope you were watching Dr. Taylor's foot. His left foot was doing the waltz rhythm, one, two, three, one, two, three. His hands were doing something a lot smoother and somehow camouflaging that. But if you really listen, I'm sure you could hear the waltz. Rhythm is something that's felt through our body and it's the most physical, perhaps, of all the three elements of music. And uh, a lot of us classical musicians practice with something called a metronome that helps us keep time. And that's very good. It's very good to practice with it, but it's no good if it only comes from the outside. Rhythm is, has to be felt through the body. It's something internal. Now, jazz players create the rhythm through the way they articulate the melody. And of course, also through the kind of accompaniment they give themselves. Um, they are composing at the same time as they are playing. We're going to play a waltz together now, written by Dr. Taylor, and it's called An Empty Ballroom. Now, hear how both the classical and the jazz style come together in this piece. We are now going to switch to music from Latin America. That's my part of the world. Both classical and jazz music come 
a lot of it comes from African roots. Uh, in the case of South American music, it, at times it also comes from gaucho roots, and we're going to talk about that later, Indian roots. But African roots are typical of Brazilian music. And uh, the first piece and the next piece I'm going to play, it's called Sagaz by composer Ernesto Nazaret. And he composed lots of tangos, so-called tangos, and they are all based on this basic uh, habanera rhythm. Now that's like the mother rhythm or that traveled throughout South America and it took different shapes and it sounds slightly different according to what country it went to and the Brazilian tango has something very smooth and very tropical and warm sounding about it. So here is the piece called Sagas by Ernesto Nazaret. The Brazilian tango is uh, similar to things that are done in jazz. Uh, the habanera that uh, uh, was just played prior to playing that particular piece uh, it was uh, something which was uh, that rhythm. Uh, we hear that in jazz. For instance, in the St. Louis blues, you hear. So you see, it takes it takes all kinds of forms in in, uh, in the bass line and in other parts of the of the piece. Years ago, uh, many uh, musicians were sent down to South America and to other parts of the country uh, of the world, and uh, the ones who went down to South America came back with uh, an interesting kind of music from Brazil. The Brazilian musicians had been listening to cool jazz. They'd been listening to the music of Stan Getz and Jerry Mulligan and uh, many musicians who at that time lived on the west coast of uh, uh, the United States. And so they took their samba and made it a little softer to kind of uh, conform with the kind of jazz they were hearing from those musicians. 
Dizzy Gillespie, who uh, was uh, a very um, wonderful musician who loved Latin music of all kinds, uh, went to Brazil and discovered uh, the bossa nova, the kind of music that they were making. And uh, he came back and uh, he, I was working with him and he said, uh, hey, you know, I've heard this wonderful kind of rhythm. And he showed me uh, what he heard down there. And uh, he asked me to write a piece for him to perform on Sesame Street. And I did. And this is the piece I wrote for him. It's a kind of a samba, uh, but it was written for Dizzy Gillespie, and I called it Diz. <laughs> going to play next a piece called Malambo by Alberto Ginastera, who incidentally was one of my teachers at the National Conservatory in Buenos Aires. This piece has a very strong rhythm and it's a gaucho rhythm. Uh, the roots are gauchesco and uh, the gauchos are South American cowboys and they play songs, they dance at times around the fireplace accompanying themselves with a guitar. In this particular piece, it's like a competition between the gauchos to see who can do fancier and fancier steps. Their boots have taps, so it makes a clickety noise as they dance. So here's Malambo by Hinastera.
Now, you notice the difference between the way she was playing Chopin and some of the European classical music and the way she played uh, uh, the kind of uh, Latin and South American you know, body language and moving and, and really into the spirit of, of the, the kind of music. Uh, much of jazz and much of uh, Latin music has that kind of uh, a spirit. And it's in the melodies, it's in the harmonies, and it's in the rhythms too. And it just kind of uh, permeates uh, the whole piece when you play that uh, kind of music. Uh, this is something that I wrote that uh, actually was originally written for uh, a Haitian drummer whose name was Tiroro. Uh, but a good friend of mine, Tito Puente, uh, heard it, liked it, and uh, made a record of it. And uh, it was so good, his record was so good, everybody thought he wrote it. So they called it Titoro. I kept the name, I, li I like the name, and so it's called Titoro now. And uh, this is the way it sounds when I play it uh, as a piano solo. We'd like to uh, 
invite you to call in, those of you who are looking at us on uh, um, satellite, you can call in and ask questions about the differences and the similarities of uh, classical and jazz music. The number to call is 800-578-1396. Now with us in the auditorium are a wonderful group of students, and while we're waiting, uh, let's start with our students here. Uh, we have anyone to, yeah, we have someone at the microphone there. Almost. Do you have a question? What made you decide to work together? Oh, well, that's a very good question. Can I take that? Sure. We are colleagues. We both teach uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And at times, we have shared the same room. And uh, I've heard Dr. Tello pr practicing, and he's heard me practice. And we each learned from each other, and we, we felt so stimulated from being together that we decided to do this kind of program to bring out the similarities and the difference between the styles. It just totally fell in place by loving to hear each other and learning from each other. It's something that we both uh, enjoy doing, and uh, uh, though the music, as I said earlier, is quite different, what we uh, do to try to learn to play it and to share it with others uh, is very similar. You have a question also. Do jazz composers write down the music in the same way as classical composers do? Uh, yes, on some occasions. Some jazz uh, uh, composers, when I write uh, a piece uh, which is a jazz piece, if I want someone else to play it, then I have to write it down because no one knows what's in my head until I put it down in, in a fashion that someone else can uh, uh, decide, well, I can play this part of it, I can do what it, uh, I would like to do with it. So, yes, we write the music down sometimes, but not like classical composers because uh, if you are going to do something from a classical composer, you really have to do everything that he, that he wrote or she wrote because uh, there uh, in the European classical tradition, what they do is say, uh, he, this is exactly what I'm trying to say musically. And the best you can do is, is to say, let me put my spirit into the music that this great composer gave me to play. We have a, a phone uh, from Miami, Florida. Can we hear you? Go ahead, caller. What's your name? Sergio. Can't hear you. Say oh, it my again. My name Sergio. Sergio. Okay. Sergio. Okay. Uh, what's your question? Well, my question is, like, like if you're composing a classical song and a jazz song, like what are some of the differences you would put? Well, in the, in the jazz song, uh, what you'll, you'll have space for improvisation. You notice everything I played when I played alone, uh, I was playing a development of the me melody that I played. And none of that was written down. I was making that up as I went along. So the people who've been in the room while I was practicing would see that each, one of, each time I played it, I played it quite differently. But uh, on the, the pieces that we play together, uh, you'll, you'll find that I, I wrote out what we're going to play, and we uh, played from a classical point of view there. In the classical pieces, you would also put a, metron a metronome marking and a tempo marking. Yes, there's a phone call from Portland, Oregon. Go ahead, Colonel. Um, good morning. I, um, how are you doing, Mr. Taylor? I'm fine. How are good, you? Good. Um, and good morning to the other pianist. I'm, I'm not familiar with her. Her name, name. is Miss Alevsky. Miss Taylor is fine. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I just happened to turn on the television this morning and seen you all playing, and I thought, I think that you all are wonderful. Um, I'm calling. This question is somewhat directed towards, I guess, mainly towards Mr. Taylor. Um, I am a gospel piano player from out of uh, the West Coast area, um, and my main uh, style um, kind of circulates from the jazz. I'm a classical trombone player by training, and I've switched to um, the piano in the last few years out of a need um, in, a, in the church that I belong to. So my style has somewhat de developed um, uh, from the classical training. But my question for Mr. Taylor is, how do you, what do you think about um, gospel music, um, our current gospel music on the East and West Coast or throughout our country, and how do you relate that to um, the jazz um, that you're playing and some of the chords and things of that nature? Well, I grew up in the church right here, in, uh, well, nearby. We're in Virginia here, but in Washington, D.C., and so much of my music is informed by uh, the gospel that you play. And so there's a, uh, many, there are many similarities in that and what I do in jazz. There's improvisation, and there are many other aspects of it. We have another call. Uh, go ahead. 
right here. Oh, um, if you've been playing classical music, what do you need to do to be able to play jazz? Well, you need to create a different kind of vocabulary, musical vocabulary. You need to work very much on what we call voicing, harmonization. You need to have an excellent ear to be a good jazz player, plus a good technique. But it's, uh, I think the primary element would be to have a very good ear and practice a lot your chords and your scales and arpeggios too. Is that right, really? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because when you play jazz, you have to make up melodies and you have to have that control to be able to uh, do the kinds of things that will help you play spontaneously. We have a phone call from Burgess, Virginia. Hello. Hi, Mr. Lesky and Mr. Teller. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes hi. Oh, okay. Um, this question is really for Mr. Teller. I'm also a gospel player, um, but I play by ear. I can't read any music. And I play by ear, and I was listening at you. And um, your style, I love your style. It's similar to, the, to what I do, but what would you suggest I do so that I know what I'm doing? rather than just playing by ear spontaneously? Well, uh, it's very easy to learn how to read music, and it, it's uh, one of the things that mu the, the written music, is. Uh, those are just symbols for what you need to be playing. So you can go to a good classical teacher and, or a jazz teacher and learn how to do that, but the idea is to incorporate the things that you already can do, and so you need to have a, a, a teacher who can take you from where you are to where you would like to go. We have uh, another question here. Are there classical composers who have used the jazz style in their music? Yes, there are. There are several, in fact. Uh, I don't know if you have heard any Ravel music, but Ravel was very much inspired by jazz music. Now, he's a French composer. Stravinsky used jazz in his music, too. He was a Russian composer. And there are many others. Uh, yeah, more recently, Leonard Bernstein, of course, is better known um, among young people for the many other things that he did. But he, too, used uh, uh, much jazz in his uh, larger comp uh, compositions for chorus and for symphony orchestra and so forth. We have a phone call from Dale City, Virginia. Go ahead, caller. What's Hello? Your name? Yes. yes. Yeah, I had a question about um, independence. When you guys are playing, a bass note with your left hand, and then you're doing it. It sounds like you're doing kind of like a solo type thing with your right hand. How do you develop that independence as far as, because uh, it's like a polyrhythm, I guess, right? Practice. Practice is a good, <laughs> yeah. Is there any, is there any particular yeah, you have as far as like, do you have to break it down to where, where each rhythm or where each beat, it falls on the, uh, on the left hand or? Yes, um, you have to decide what to listen. Your ear has to guide you first. What is it that you want to listen to? Once you make that decision, then the hands will be responding independently, and of course you will practice so that they become more and more physically more independent. But the first decision has to be made by your ear. It does. And you have to practice sometimes uh, uh, one hand at a time. Practice your left hand so you, get, you make sure you're doing all of the notes right. That way you won't build in uh, mistakes and have to unlearn the mistake. Uh, yes, you have a question. What is the difference between improvising and playing by ear? The uh, improvising is making up something as you go. Uh, the uh, uh, playing by ear, you can play anything. You heard a couple of uh, people who was asking us questions on the phone who play by ear. They can listen to Beethoven, they can listen to church music, they can listen to anything and play that by ear. So that's, that's a particular different thing. And, uh, well, hey, I wish I could spend, and both of us could spend more time uh, answering your questions, but uh, we've run out of time for questions, and we hope you've enjoyed our program. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, or if we didn't fully answer your question, you can e email us at the address on the screen and ask additional questions for two weeks. We'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to answer your questions. You can also find additional information about us classroom activities that integrate the arts into the curriculum, and information on our upcoming programs on the Kennedy Center website at the address also shown on the screen. We'd also like to hear uh, what you think of the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series. So we've provided an electronic, evalu uh, an electronic evaluation form. And I 
Thank you. You'll find it on the Prince William Network website. And we are asking you, please fill it out so that we can select topics and resources that you need to enhance your classroom experience. Our next performance will be Monday, December 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, when members of the National Symphony Orchestra will demonstrate the connections between science and music. We have one more piece we would like to play for you. The title is Uncle Bob, and it's written by Dr. Taylor. We want you to watch the left hand as it keeps rhythm. In jazz, this style is called stride. Classical pianists don't use the left hand in the same way as jazz players. This song, which is ragtime, is a good workout for the left hand using the stride technique. As you heard in Malambo, uh, Ms. Olewski was using her left hand quite a bit. Now what we're going to do is something like this. I'll demonstrate it. If, if you were counting and as we were playing, uh, you might uh, want to just say uh, there's a bass note on one and three and a chord on two and four, like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. The only difference is we're going to do it a lot faster than that. But that's basically what we're doing. And we hope you'll take uh, what you've heard today with you and continue to listen. It's all music, some different, some similar, and some not. But we uh, both approach playing the piano the same way. We practice, we learn scales, we play arpeggios. We do all of the things that help us say something musical to you. Uh, coincidentally, we both had uncles who were very musical. Dr. Taylor had his uncle Bob, who introduced him to ragtime, and I had my tío, Oscar, in Argentina, who used to come to the house and play tangos by ear. So we're going to play Uncle Bob's Rack Time for you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're a wonderful audience. I'm glad that you came, um, and I, we both love the response.